Can you hear me? Going through the speakers at all? No? I'm on? Not static or anything? Awesome. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Um, okay, well, we will go ahead and uh, pray and get started um, today. Father, thank you uh, for you. God, thank you that we have a relationship with you, that we can walk with you, that we can talk with you, that you are our God and we are your people. We thank you and we praise you, Jesus. I just pray as, as we get into your word, Father, that this isn't just like a normal day where we go and just sit through a sermon, but that you, who are alive and active through your word, would, would let it bear on our hearts and let it change us. Um, open our eyes to see the scripture the way that we, we should. Uh, we thank you, we praise you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. So today, we are going to be out of John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Uh, so, I remember back in the day, I was like 18 years old, so it was a long time ago, uh, getting a call. It was on my house phone. I still lived at my parents' house. We didn't have, have caller ID, so didn't know who was calling at the time. And it wasn't that crazy. Wasn't that a crazy time not having caller ID? Like, the youth probably can't even think about it. Like, what are you even talking about? Like, so there was this time where the phone would ring and you just have to answer it. It was crazy, right? Just had to pick up the phone, had no idea who was calling. It was absolute chaos. Uh, you know, you used to actually have a phone number to call for the time that would tell you the time or the weather. It's crazy. Get, you used to actually have to call for the movie theater show times. Like, you couldn't just look it up online. You used to have to call, and if it was busy, you had to wait, and you had to sit there with your pen and write down what time this movie started. It was just nuts, man. Um, yeah, it was just so crazy. But it's different now. But anyways, I got this call back in the day. This girl started, started talking when I picked up the phone. She sounded really excited, talking about that I just won this trip to the Bahamas. Uh, my head started spinning. I remember I entered all those times, like I went to a store and they had these big boxes that you could write your name in and stuff like that and win a trip to the Bahamas. I couldn't believe I finally won one. So this girl's going on about what a great trip this was, telling me all that's included, like meals and airfare. And, and I'm like 18 years old. My head's getting big, thinking about how epic this trip, trip's going to be. I'm flirting with a girl on the phone because I think I'm a big shot now going on a trip to the Bahamas. Then after a few minutes of me making a fool out of myself, she hits me with it. She just says, we just need to secure this trip with a $500 processing fee on any major credit card. Come crashing down real quick. Um, they needed the money that this trip would have cost for a processing fee. Um, didn't have any money, didn't have a credit card. And after a minute, probably a little bit longer than it should have taken, I realized I hadn't won anything. It was a sales call, and a sales call designed to look like I had actually won something. I felt so dumb. I fell for it. I fell for it big time. Needless to say, the girl that I was flirting with wasn't so interested in me. Um, she didn't really want to talk to me much anymore after she found out I had no credit card, and this was a dead sale. We hung up the phone, and I quickly came back down to earth. It was a bait and switch tactic. I learned about it very, very well that day, where someone brings you in with a false promise and then switches everything up. It's so common right now though, right? Like it's kinda, kinda everywhere. So it's so refreshing when somebody is just blunt with something, like the truth, like this is what it is. This is what I ask of you and this is what I will give you in return. Straight up blunt truth. We need more of it, man. But this is what, what Jesus does with his invitation to us. Give up your life. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me, which we went into detail last week. He says if we do that, he will give us life, true life. While you live on this earth, you will have it. But the invitation doesn't stop there because he says I will also give you eternal life. In paradise, 
with him forever. And this is what we're going to talk about today. The invitation that doesn't end here on earth. Jesus says, come follow me, not just now, but into eternity. John 14, 1 through 3 says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. I love that, just thinking about that. Where I am, you may be also. What an incredible, incredible promise, full of, of hope and expectation. So, so, like I was saying last week, we discussed what the invitation begins with denying ourselves, taking up our cross, following Jesus, surrendering completely to his will for our life. And then and only then will we find true life the way it was meant to be lived. Today we're going to talk about what the rest of the invitation entails. You know, Jesus being the good shepherd, he's got us on this, this straight and narrow path, he calls it, right? And the word of God, he will use to keep us on that path. Sometimes it will say, don't go over here. Sometimes it will say, don't go over here. Sometimes it will stop us because there's trouble coming. Other times we will be in the weeds and in the thorns, and the Bible brings that up to us that that's where we're at, and it hurts. Other times on the straight and narrow path, his word just encourages us just gives us hope, pushes us along, says, let's go, keep going, keep going. This is what the doctrine of heaven does for us. It says, keep going, look at what we have. So I want you to be encouraged today as we talk about this. We're not going to talk about how the invitation concludes because it doesn't conclude, ever. It plays out for all of eternity, our walk with the Lord in heaven. And, and what the Bible says it will be like is amazing. It's going to give us a better idea today of what's written on the invitation and what we have to look forward to. You know, a lot of people will think clouds and harps and uh, floating souls without bodies or a never-ending church service. And I am pleased to say it will not be any of that. Would anyone look forward to that? Like a never-ending church service? You don't have to grumble while I'm up here. Like, <laughs> but no, seriously, like nobody wants to, to hear me learning to play the harp for all of eternity. <laughs> Believe me, you would not want to hear that. Jesus for sure wouldn't. But in short, what heaven is, is us and creation as they were meant to be from the beginning. Perfect free from the curse of sin and death in the presence of God, perfect in every way, including us. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44 says, So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, meaning the body that we have right now, that we're living in is perishable. But it will be raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So we will be raised imperishable in glory and power. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 53 goes on to describe this. I, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and morta mortal with immortality. So, to break this down, Paul is saying that these bodies, these frail bodies that we have, they cannot inherit the kingdom of God. They are under the curse of sin. That's why our bodies die and start to break down. We all know this. We all feel it, live it every day. Younger kids might not know it so much, but they will. They will. 
we break down, and as we get older, it just happens. We break down. In fact, the, the youth would tell you that they know this as they left me voicemails the day that we were playing softball saying, I hope you don't break a hip. Yeah, that was fun. And then they proceeded to beat us. <laughs> but we break down. You know, you might have great metabolism when you're younger, eat all kinds of food and not gain weight. Man, that was nice, wasn't it? Right now I can, like, gain 10 pounds by smelling a Big Mac. I used to not, not have to get a whole lot of sleep, feel fine. Like, I'd get an hour, maybe two, um, and I'd be okay all day in my youth. But now... I can actually hurt myself in my sleep. How does that even happen? How does that even happen? Like, I'll sleep on my neck wrong. And if somebody's talking to me over here, I can't look at them. I got to go like this. Like, turn, turn just to look at them. Oh, you'll know it when you get older. Mm. These aren't our eternal bodies, though. This passage says that we will be changed. These bodies will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, which is faster than a blink. Looking it up, it says it was 11 one hundredths of a second. Almost instantly, we will put on a new immortal body. Perfect. Free of, of defects in every way. One that can't be harmed or hurt, won't, pe- won't feel pain at all. Won't need sleep. Perfect mind free of the curse of depression. It won't ever feel darkness or anxiety or worry. The Bible says there will be a feast in heaven when we're there. Which means that we will enjoy food without ever having to to have it to live because our bodies won't need that. But in this feast, there's going to be a celebration like the world has never ever seen before. Revelation 19, 6 to 9. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, Paul is saying, then I heard, or I'm sorry, John is saying, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice, rejoice and exalt and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. The true words of God. You have been invited, invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is going to be a reality for you one day if you are in Christ. If you know Jesus, if you have accepted his invitation This is a celebratory feast and the celebration of the wedding between us and Christ. We're in heaven united with him as well as believers that have passed and Old Testament saints. Think of a wedding reception, but much, much bigger and much longer. Sometimes marriage celebrations in Jewish tradition would last days sometimes even weeks. I don't know. I don't know for sure. But I tend to think that if time were measured there the way it is now, this feast would last years, maybe even lifetimes. That's kind of my imagination, thinking that that's how it might play out. But you'll be celebrating, laughing like you've never laughed before, knowing joy like you've never known joy before, praising Jesus, sitting next to those who right now you are missing. And this will be be real for you. Joy, love, and the presence of God will permeate every square inch of the atmosphere here. People, People now like to think they know how to party and celebrate. They haven't seen anything compared to what is waiting for us right now. The Bible says that, or alludes to, that we will have jobs and work to do. But it won't be labor, laborious, or or tedious. 
we will, we will do it and we will love doing it for the glory of God and out of love for him and his creation. So look at, look at Adam before the fall. He, uh, God gave Adam the task of naming different animals, right? Which means that he gave him creativity and he gave him a way to use that creativity. And then he told him to subdue the earth in the garden. So he gave him tasks and work to do. We should, we should expect the same. We may have been created with different gifts and a different purpose than Adam. God's going to have a perfect plan for us. You know, we, we tend to think of, of work and we get down. But work wasn't meant to be what it is now. It wasn't meant to be hard on us. The reason it feels like laborious and tedious to us now is because of part of the curse of sin. God told Adam it was going to be hard now. And remember, we're not going to have new bo- we will, we're going to have new bodies that don't get tired, that don't feel pain. And I promise you, the way that God has created you to be unique and and the plan that he has for you for eternity will be perfect for you and you would not have it any other way. You wouldn't want anything different than what God has planned for you. Not for a second. In heaven, we're going we're gonna to do this work, work and we're going to live on the new earth. Revelation 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. So a new earth, the way that God intended it to be. Free from the curse of, of sin and not marred by sin and death. It will be beautiful beyond description. You've seen some of the beauty of this earth. Like everybody's seen it, a perfect sunrise that you can't look away from. The smoky mountains as, as the morning mist rises. It's beautiful, man. You know, I've heard some of the mountains out west look, make the Smokies look like foothills. And, and I've heard they will just take your breath away. You'll see the, the sky when the sun is setting and, and how it's so perfect with the clouds blending into a pink sky and you will swear that it's been painted by somebody. The, um, the enormous oceans of the world and their power just will make grown men cry when seeing it for the first time. The, the thick forest, the Amazon rainforest, vast deserts, peaceful rivers. The earth is full of a wonderful, beautiful creation. But it's not anywhere to where it should be. Not even close. It's actually a world that's been ravaged by the effects of sin. And kind of like a war zone, it's beaten down and depleted and ravaged and not what it was before the war. So if creation now, not being what it should be and once was, makes us stand in awe and wonder at its beauty, how beautiful and perfect you think the new earth would be, made by God himself without the effects of the, of the curse of sin. Can we even imagine that? It will be perfect in every way. This passage says that there is no sea. You know, there's a lot of different viewpoints on this. Um, some literally think there will be no sea. Some think that it means that there will be no Mediterranean Sea since when John wrote this, he was exiled on the island of Patmos and he probably would have been looking at that sea, but I think that's, personally, I think that's a big stretch. Others think that the sea is a metaphor for, for chaos because that's what they knew the sea as back then. Um, I tend to think it's literally because everything that he says around this happens to be literal at the time. So I kind of think that's what it is and not metaphorical, but we'll, we'll see. I could be completely wrong. Either way, it will be perfect and you will not want it any other way. On this new earth will be the new Jerusalem, God's holy city. Revelation 21, 2 says, and I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
a city of unparalleled beauty. Again, perfect in every single way. Can you imagine what a, a perfect city made by God himself would even look like? Could you imagine? The Bible kind of gives us an idea for a second. Revelation 20, 10, 21, 10 to 11. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, great and high. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. So, out of heaven, from God. Twice it has been described like this. Heaven from God, from God. It shines with the glory of God, and it looks like nothing you've ever seen before. You're not going to want to take your eyes off of it. You will probably be in complete disbelief of what you're looking at. This city, and I encourage you to read um, Revelation chapter 21 for more of this description. We don't have time to, to cover it all today. It's going to be enormous. Uh, Revelation 21, 16 says the city lies four square. It's length the same as its width, and he measured the city with its rod. 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. So 12,000 stadia is 1,500 miles on each side. And then he goes to say that it's 1,500 miles high. That's how big the, just the city of the New Jerusalem will be. It's kind of crazy to even think about, right? Like, how can you even grasp that? Now, I'm glad we'll be in, in bodies that don't get tired. Could you imagine climbing up those stairs? <laughs> that would be a lot of stairs. But in this, in this city, there will be no temples, no church buildings, and for a good and wonderful reason. Revelation twenty one twenty two says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Because he is there. We will worship him right in front of him. And we'll gaze at the God who saved us as we sing songs of praise to him. There's not going to be any sun there. We won't need one. Revelation 21, 23. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light. And the lamb is its lamp. God's glory is going to shine in such a way that darkness is but like a fleeting memory that we've just forgotten. It's completely wiped out. And this will play out for all of eternity. Have you ever thought about how big eternity is? Like if you have, we hear the song, Amazing Grace. It says, when we've been there 10,000 years. And then it goes on to sing about another 10,000 years. But that's, that's doesn't even hold really a candle to what eternity really is. Like, so I've used this illustration before. Imagine all the grains of sand on the earth. Every grain of sand on the earth. I mean, if you were to be on a beach, you would pick up a handful, and pour them out. There'd be hundreds of thousands. They would just fall out of your hand. Imagine each one of those grains of sand, not just in your hand, but that covered the entire earth. Imagine that each one of those grains of sand was a lifetime. Still wouldn't even come close to cover an eternity. But this life, this life here on earth is just one, just one grain of sand and maybe when you pour all the, the hundreds and thousands out of your hand, it just kind of sticks in the crack of your hand. Just that one little lifetime. That's all we have here. That's all we have. This life and this earth, what we have here is so temporary, man. It is here and gone. You know, I think of, of Eliana being born. It was six years ago, but it feels like yesterday. And when I break it down in just five more, just five more of those little six-year periods, I'm going to be 75 years old. 
it just goes by so fast. Everything flies by. The Bible says that this, this life is just a mist, like a vapor. It appears and vanishes. But in this little, little period of life, we can have and deal with immense amounts of pain. And we will deal with struggles and hurt and poverty and sin and unheard of problems. And the struggles are real and the pain is real. I never want to trivialize any of that that anybody could ever be going through. But listen to me. They're temporary. They are temporary. The pain you have is temporary. The struggle you have is temporary. There is not a single problem or worry that you have or will have on this life that will last. It will all go away. Every bit of it. Financial problems, not in heaven. Pain, not in the new body. Depression, not in the new mind. All of the struggle in this life will be done. Jesus will have made all things new. Revelation 21, 4 to 5 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. No more tears, death, mourning, crying, or pain. Jesus has made it all new. This is what he does. This is the inheritance of the saints. Eternity and paradise with Jesus. If the worship team would would come forward. Brothers and sisters who have have accepted this invitation, I just want to encourage you. The pain and the struggle temporary all temporary you have eternity with your savior waiting for you jesus is preparing a place for you right now be encouraged be excited we should be you know have you ever um you know the last day before you're about to go on vacation like you're at work and the last day you're just in like a great mood because like the next week all your problems are going to be gone you're going to be on vacation it's going to be awesome even the guy that's kind of like rude and standoffish to everybody at at work you're even talking to him and getting along great with him because you're in a good mood you're about to go on vacation we should be like that like all the time because we have that waiting for us paradise with jesus waiting for us For those that haven't accepted the invitation, I have good news for you. The invitation is not closed, not yet. Jesus knocks at the door and waits for you to answer. And if you give your life to him, he will give himself to you. And you will know peace and love and hope like you've never known before. And you will have the promise of heaven, of joyous expectation of what's to come. the the invitation from him to you has been extended. Come to the cross and lay down your sins. During this song, you have have the opportunity to come up to the the stage, the altar, or in your seat to give your life to Jesus. If you need help praying that and, and, and expressing to Jesus what your heart is feeling, just come let me know and we'll pray together. If you would stand with me, we're gonna go ahead and pray. And, um, worship with the worship team as they they lead us out today. Father, thank you. Thank you that with with all of the the sin and the horrible hard things that we have to endure on this earth that we have the promise that you have waiting for us in heaven, Lord. That one day we're going to walk with you free of pain, free of of hurt, free of sin, free of temptation, free of it all. We're going to be able to walk with our Savior. And Jesus, we look forward to that so much, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for giving us that hope, Lord. 
Father, I pray that my brothers and sisters would be encouraged today, that you would come up alongside them this week, Father, and just remind them, remind them this is temporary. What we have in you, that's eternal. I pray for your blessings and your peace over my brothers and sisters, Lord. We thank you and we praise you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.